name is Owen Estwick. Now, tonight we are looking at the historical evolution of, the, of club cricket in Barbados during the period 1800 to 1950. Um, and this study traces the evolution of cricket clubs in Barbados during the period between the 1800s and the 1950s. The focus here is on socio-economic and socio-cultural factors involved. In particular, the investigation seeks to ground the development of cricket culture in the heavily in encrusted racialist, post-emancipation realities of the emerging society. <coughs> the role of the military in building a club cricket culture in Barbados is on the score, as are aspects of the liberation struggle which intensifies in the late 19th century and widens up to the 1930s. In the final analysis, the study hopes to enhance our understanding of how issues beyond the boundary impact on the development of club cricket and other aspects of cricketing culture over the period between being surveyed. So it is my particular pleasure to introduce Professor Emeritus Pedro L. V. Welch. And he, as you all may be aware, is a retired deputy principal of the, of the UE. In 19, 2017, he was conferred with the title of Professor Emeritus by the UE. He's also served previously as Dean, Faculty of Humanities and Education, and Professor of Social and Medical History <coughs> in the Department of History and Philosophy at the UE. He's the recipient, recipient of a number of awards. These include a Commonwealth Scholarship in 1984, a 1992 John Hopkins Fellowship, and in, 19, and in December 2009, the Principal Award of Excellence at the UE. Professor Welch has written or co-authored several books and articles, including Red and Black Over White, Free Colored Women in Pre Pre-Emancipation Barbados, 2000, and Slave Society in the City, Bridgetown, Barbados, 1680 to 1834, and that was written in 2003. He's also editor of the Journal of the Barbados Museum and Historical Society. Professor Welch has delivered several public addresses internationally in the USA, the United Kingdom, France, and Canada, and in several Caribbean countries, and has appeared on BBC television broadcasts in the UK and on NBC broadcasts in the USA. He's also delivered numerous public lectures in Barbados. He is the current chairman of the Task Force on Barb Reparations in Barbados. He's married to the former Joan Winter and they have two children, Dr. Pedro A. Welch, MRCS GP, and Jem Welch, a graduate of the UE and a teacher of the Holder Nursery, in Maria Holder Nursery School in Barbados. He's an elder and organist of the Breath of Life Seventh-day Adventist Church. I, that's a script, but I have known Professor, I should say, I knew his father on my first day I went to work in the um, Harbin Shipping Department when um, his, his then father was senior labor officer in the what was then Karenish House. Of course, um, I I known his mother before that because I, I worked with the your aunt Muriel in the Pabellion's yard, and more particularly, I have only recently been deserted by his sister um, <coughs> Sonia, who as PSPM served on one of the statutory corporations in which I had the privilege to serve. So I am among family and friends. I feel very comfortable to be doing this. And uh, it is therefore not my role to say anything more other than to wish and call to the podium Professor Pedro Welch. And I wish you all to participate in and make it a night that we will all remember. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Mr. Moderator. Zestric, whom we've known for some time, um, I am aware of that family history. And certainly, it is a real pleasure for me to have you moderate um, tonight's presentation. And before I begin the presentation, I wish to issue a bit of a disclaimer. And that disclaimer has to do with the fact that I have never played um, cricket in any meaningful way. And the reason why I never played any cricket in a meaningful way <clears throat> has to do with the fact that when I attended secondary school, um, there was a practice one evening, and I, and I went to, to the practice, and I was standing behind the practice net. I was not on the side where the action was taking place. And there was one hole in that net, and the ball seemed to meander through, off the pitch through that hole, and it struck me in my face. And I swore at that point that if that <clears throat> was what happened to me, and it was not with the bat in my hand, then cricket was certainly not for me. And I was not going to be involved with anybody hurling a missile at me at you know, tremendous speed. I did hover after that play in a couple of set matches in those days at from Boys Foundation School. There was what we call various sets of houses. Set, I was in set B, and I did play a little cricket. But like most Barbadians, and I have to emphasize that, I became more a commentator and an, uh, that, and an, and an observer rather than a participant um, fully in cricket. Um, my knowledge of cricket, therefore, is, I said, is that of, a of an observer, commentator. I recall um, when the West Indies went to Australia, I should sure remember, sure remember that date, but I know it was early, late 50s, early 60s, we I went to Australia, and my great, great aunt, Aunt Days, who was a, a very, very active follower of the West Indies, um, got me up every morning around, I think it was around 3, 3 a.m. or 4 a.m. to listen to the matches on Radio Fusion. And I think I got hooked um, into, um, into the regular listening, um, especially in those days when the West Indies team used to be uh, more adept at playing cricket than they are today. I must say that my position as an observer um, led me, when I observed the West Indies facing Afghanistan recently, to, to sp speculate a bit um, on what was happening to the West Indies team. And when I observed the Afghanis bowling and the West Indies batsmen apparently flat-footed, it troubled me just a bit. But then it occurred to me that perhaps the, Af the Afghani um, batsmen and the bowlers are going through a transition in much the same way as the West Indies went through a transition in the 1930s and the 40s, etc. And therefore, they are hungrier. And not only hungrier, but they are, are definitely more zealous in terms of their approach to the game. And so I expect great things from them as they continue um, playing cricket. So we have no, I, don't, I don't have any quarrel with the Afghan people from Afghanistan. My basic quarrel is with batsmen who seem to have forgotten how to move down, um, move down the pitch, who move down the wicket, and, and bat. I remember years ago, too, as a youngster, there was a, ma a fellow from Austria, I think his name was Wally Grout. I don't know if anybody can remember that name. Um, Wally Grout was not a very tall batsman, but he had a particular technique. He never waited for the ball to pitch. He would step down the wicket and hit the ball. And that is how he, ma he, he handled spin. That's how he handled the, um, that, you know, bone of that type. So I think the batsmen in the West Indies team may need to do a little bit of historical reflection and introspection and see how they can get back to a position of winning once again. So th therefore, with that background, and without any further ado, I wish to introduce you to um, a club cricket in Barbados, 1800 to 1950. I might step back before 1800 from time to time, but I, I hope that as a result of our, our encounter here this evening, that we all become a lot more enlightened on the course of, of history as far as it relates to the game of cricket. So let's begin. The existence of club cricket in Barbados and the rest of the Anglophone Caribbean has, to all intents and purposes, been taken as something normal. That is a reflection of the extent to which cricket has become part of the social landscape. So embedded has cricket become, and so embedded has it, has it entered into our residential culture, 
that even in an age in which other competitors have largely displaced the cricket game from the village streets, and I refer here to basketball and football and more recently world tennis, most persons probably still view cricket or the cricket game as a perpetual fixture of our urban and rural residential scene. I intend here tonight to present what I termed historical archaeology of club cricket in Barbados in an attempt to expose us to the heavily encrusted social evolution of a game whose origins in an elite sociocultural and even racist matrix is still largely unknown to a cricket-loving public beyond the boundary. To enable our search, we trace the game in Barbados to its earliest discernible historical origins and also invoke some issues of the historical development of the game in England and elsewhere in the English colonial world in order to unearth the origins of the game in this little 166 or 166 and a half, I don't know, so if the addition of Pelican Island, if it's a little bit more, square mile rock. There can be little doubt that the emergence of a cricket club culture in Barbados and elsewhere in the Caribbean lies in the importation of aspects of English culture. The church and elements of the educational system that emerged in the West Indies represent some of the identifiable aspects of English culture that were imported. Additionally, the relevant data indicate that elements of recreational culture also entered the region. Thus, while they have not so far located a similar reference for Barbados, the lifestyle of the English planter Thomas Cecilwood, um, who migrated to Jamaica, where he eventually owned a plantation, is instructive on this point. Cecilwood had a background in cricket before he left England for Jamaica. And we find an intriguing reference to the game in an entry for Friday, September the 16th, 1748, for Jamaica. He just returned from a visit um, to India, where he had traded some goods and made a little profit. Now, in his first month back in England, and we talk about 1748, he tells us that he had paid an entrance fee to a ground belonging to the Royal Artillery, and he records the gem which you see on the screen. Long and Robin and White Mark got 27 at cricket, instead of the double T, but that's all right, against Faulkner and Harris, who got but 15. That's the first reference that we have, in my, to my understanding, which, is, which links the English cricketing culture to the Caribbean. Um, and certainly, um, in the case of Cecilwood, I'm using him as a proxy for what might have happened in Barbados. Some 28 years later, Cecilwood, by this time resident some 28 years in Jamaica, recorded his recreational activities in a visit to the estate of a prominent landowner, William Beckford. And this is what he says to us, and we see it on the screen again. Thursday, 11th of June, 1778. Breakfast said at Mr. Beckford's, played at billiards, and etc. Look over many folio volumes of excellent plates of the rules of Rome, etc., etc., etc. In the evening, Mr. Beckford, no, go, go back, please, yes. Yes, yes. In the evening, yes, so Mr. Beckford and Mr. John Lewis, etc., played at cricket. So here in the Caribbean, in 1778, here is a planter who is giving us, who is, who is opening to us a view of what they call of social and recreational importation. It's happening, and Sister Wood represents that example that I am trying to use as a proxy. Sister Wood's inclusion of cricket in the description of the social etiquette of the plantation, of plantation society, serves to introduce us to the social role of the club in the colonial society of Barbados and other societies in the Anglophone Caribbean. Cricket, above all, is a game that is exquisitely founded on ritual. And its early organization under social groupings that we might identify as clubs was part of the transfer of social etiquette into the new world. David Shields, excellent surveyor of social life in the British New World colonies, written in a, a work called um, Civil Tongues and Polite Letters, offers a useful comment on this importation of this club culture. And, the, and he reads, and, and what he says reads, Sunday socials, holiday feasts, 
court days, horse races, card parties, and balls. And I put, I put and inserted into this, into this round of discussion, this round of descriptions, and mostly cricket. All such occasions took place regularly, and all reasserted the already constituted character of community. Persons performed conventionalized roles that secure them in a traditional communal identity. By performing in these rituals, individuals and families projected their status in society. Like games, certain rights were occasions of competition. Persons in accord with strict rules asserted their mastery over play. And Shields surveys, we're looking at how English culture develops in the new world, not only in the Caribbean, but also in North America. And he's looking at the, uh, what we may call those social conventions, those things which are imported, which give people a sense of identity and also give them a sense of community. In short then, in considering the emergence of the cricket club in Barbados and elsewhere in the Caribbean, you must bear in mind that these social institutions reflected the social realities of the time. Indeed, Cecil Wood and his contemporaries across the British Caribbean must certainly have been aware of their social position, not only over the enslaved and the free black community, but also over those who might be considered as the poorest poor sort, the poor kinfolk, and certainly Barbados, we are referring to those people, who, um, persons who refer to as poor whites, um, who live primarily in the parts of St. John and in some parts of St. Philip in Barbados. Thus, in these very early expositions of cricket in this region, we read of the social hierarchy of the plantation. We, we, we might well ask then, um, even as we further explore the circumstances that gave rise to club cricket in Barbados, what about the non-white residents on the plantations? The enslaved and free black laborers? Certainly such residents could not be less than clear that the social groupings of which the planters were a part were not intended initially to include them at any other than a practical or even a functional level. After all, somebody had to level the cricket field. A uh, real planter might need a practice to impress his contemporaries. It was quite possible that he could, that he, that he could ask Swan to some of these social inferiors to bat in response to his bowling, or even ask them to bowl at him so he could practice his batting. Thus, by the 1780s, it is almost certain that some Caribbean blacks were being exposed to the, the game at various levels, even while they were excluded from meaningful social intercourse with their enslavers. One of the most startling discoveries of the late 1970s was the discovery of a buckle in gravel on the banks of the River Tweed in England, that's in Britain. As a Wik Wikipedia entry puts it, the buckle depicts a well muscled mulatto, probably the offspring of a white overseer and a black slave mother, and the wicket being bowled out. He is kind of a, 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 a spliceless back has a navy chain color, chain collar, sorry, around his neck. To his left, a wattle and daub slave hut can be seen, and to the right, a cane crushing windmill by a Roystonia Olaresi cabbage palm tree. I left out that part of the Olaresi thing because some of us might not quite understand what it meant. An Oxford University analysis of the buckle revealed that it must have been manufactured possibly before the before the, um, the 19th century, and most certainly not later than the early Victorian period. Further research has shown that it was made of what was called navy brass. Moreover, the engraving shows that there were three stumps, which provide strong support for a date after 1777, when the rules of the game were changed to permit three stumps. Before that time, you had two stumps um, in, the, in the cricket game. Archaeological Archaeological and historical research also suggest that the buckle was most likely commissioned by a member of the Hotham family who was stationed in Barbados between 1779 and 1780. This is a buckle found in England, and the buckle um, depicts a, an enslaved person with a bat in his a bat and being bowled out. And um, it is one of the earliest representations, again, that we can find of cricket tied to Barbados, 1778. And, um, and, and we have identified that, um, that the man who, to whom the buckle almost certainly belonged was a member of the Royal Navy. He was a, one of the, up, the he was a member of the elite, English elite, 
happened to be stationed in Barbados at the precise period that we have um, the, the dating of the buckle. The date, buckle has been examined by the experts, and as I said, the buckle definitely dates back to that period, and we can almost certainly say that the buckle is tied to the emergence of cricket in Barbados. The connection of the Navy was also important in chronicling the emergence and development of cricket clubs in Barbados and throughout the region. One of the features of the British military presence throughout the British Empire is a frequent reference to cricket in the correspondence of military officers. In 1804, for example, there is a report of a cricket match by the Hereford Militia in England. In 1852, there is another reference in the National Archives of Britain to a cricket book of the 20th Regiment of Foot, which was stationed then in Canada. And yet two other references which have located in the online repositories of the National Archives in London, they are references to notebooks of officers at, in various regiments, detailing their individual scores in various cricket matches. Moreover, there are several personal archives held in various repositories in England, the Mitford archives being a case in point, that detail the involvement of military officers in cricket matches, both at home in England and overseas. For our own purposes, it is important to note that the several army units that were located in Barbados over the 18th and 19th centuries represented important crucibles of the game. And as the scene depicted on the buckle suggests, enslaved and possibly free black laborers working for the military, and in, that, in this case the Navy, may have been one conduit by which the game spread from the elite group to the masses, to the, to, um, to the, to the laborers and to the workers. Given, given the factors that have been identified so far then, our discussion picks up the pace by locating the first formal mention of a cricket club in Barbados, and this has been recorded by several cricket historians. The first formal mention occurs in 1806 when the Barbados Mercury and Bridgestone Gazette uh, gives notice of a cricket game and the following dinner, which is presented by the treasurer of, quote, the St. Anne's Cricket Club. The first thing we know is that St. Anne's is the name given to the garrison, the location. So when I see St. Anne's, I'm not interpreting this to be a, um, a civilian club. As far as I'm concerned, St. Anne's was most likely, the evidence would suggest strongly that St. Anne's was a military, um, unit, military club. But it's often quoted or cited in several books as a civilian club. Um, and it seems clear that this reference points to the pioneering role of the British military not only to the establishment of the game in Barbados, but also more specifically to the evolution of club cricket. It's to be expected that those who organized the game at St. Anne's were officers of the garrison. But as Henry Beckles observes, the matches played at the grounds appears to have included as well several men of the lower ranks. Indeed, just 32 years after this first mention of cricket at St. Anne's is made, a match was organized between the 78th Regiment of Foot and a team from the Garrison Detachment. The 78th Regiment won the match, but the mixing of various social ranks in the match attracted the attention of local commentators. As Beckel observes, an important issue to be noted here is that the Garrison team was made up of low-ranking officers. <clears throat> this attracted the attention of Mr. Clinkett, who was an editor of the Barbados, Barbados newspaper, when he stated that such social mixing of men of different classes showed, quote unquote, the good feelings entertained by officers for their soldiers. I'm not sure that that, is, that, is, that, that kind of assessment is justified, but certainly um, there was some, some involvement of what we call the lower ranks in, the, in, the, in St. Anne's at that time. You must, of course, recognize that there was no overarching desire to de democratize the social order by including the rank and file in the matches organized by the military forces. As several researchers have noted, cricket in the 19th century, or for that matter much earlier, was an elitist sport. And the main objective was for the officer classes to introduce to the lower ranks the social etiquette that was considered essential as a standard of moral superiority. Thus, as James Campbell tells us, in addition to hunting and shooting, officers enthusiastically took to team games, especially cricket, football, and polo. These games each have similar attractions to those of field sports. Cricket is an ancient and revered game 
with origins deeply rooted in rural England, and so was a familiar and traditional game for the upper class officer. That assessment again places um, the, the issue of cricket, cricket and cricket as a really an elite sport. And if you see um, the masses, if you see the low orders being involved, one must begin to imagine that this is also part of what they call the civilizing uh, and, and, and perhaps um, the, um, the Christianizing ethic that is being employed by the upper classes um, in an attempt to bring the lower class, the lower orders into the, into the fold. Now we, we, um, we continue. There is another quote coming from the same author of this one, Campbell. Campbell again, this is what he says. Military matches have, have been played between Army and Navy officers as early as 1802. Reports of cricket matches at large between guards, officers, and members of the House of Commons and as members of other regiments occupy a large share of the text of early volumes of the Journal of the Household Brigade. A cursory reading of one of these volumes leaves the impression that guards officers were not involved with social dinners, hunts or horse racing, were entirely occupied with either playing or watching cricket matches. Rare indeed was a regiment that did not have an 11 composed of officers and the occasional enlisted soldier. Incidentally, I am of the view that there's a lot more history of cricket to be found in various military books. And I'm promising that the next time I visit the National Archives in, in London at the queue, that I'm going to see whether we, I can make um, contact with some of these journals. Um, I have done some other work uh, related to the history of medicine in Barbados, and I've come across several, several reports um, written by military officers who, who served in the Caribbean spheres and in Barbados. And in some cases, those books are in the, at the National Archives, those journals are there, and I think we can do a lot more to uncover um, the history of cricket and other um, social aspects of being in Barbados. Now he continues, this is Campbell, the next, next slide, um, and, and by showing how people view this matter of, of playing games on cricket. And this is what one officer, uh, Colonel Garnet Wilsey, as quoted by Campbell says, being a good sportsman, a good cricketer, Good at racket, so any other manly game is no mean recommendation for staff employment. Such a man without book lore is preferable to the most deeply read, read one of lethargic habits. In short, what it's really saying is that, um, that if you want to select an officer for the, for the, um, for the corps, then you don't really want a fellow who who's, um, who's spend a lot of time in, in, in Latin and other books, although that might be desirable too, but you really want the fellow to be a, a good cricket player. And then if he's a good cricket player, then he, there's hope for him. And, and, and this is common. Um, if you would, when I was a st young student at school, I read a book called The Memoirs of a Fox Hunting Man. It was one of the select books that we were given, with a man called Siegfried Sassoon. And that book um, really tells about the, the importance of, of the sporting culture for uh, developing a sense of, 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 of esprit de corps, um, among the, um, the ruling classes. The point here is that the officer who took a cricket considered it as part of a rite of passage, <coughs> excuse me, that carried with it the possibility even of social mobility. Moreover, the formation of a cricket club in Barbados, represented here as well as elsewhere, part of what the military and civilian leadership viewed as a civilizing and perhaps even a Christian, Christianizing mission to the colonials. These considerations are captured well in the commentaries which I append as follows. The first of these is extracted from Helen Meadows work on leisure in urban settings. And she says it could be obviously be argued that physical exercise was vital for those brought up in the unnatural conditions of an urban environment and destined to spend much of their lives in sedentary occupations. And that a healthy body and a sense of their being were legitimate objectives um, for any Christian. Further, yes, I, think I just want to make sure that we was here. Further, sport absorbed energies and thought which idleness may otherwise lead astray to evil outlets. And finally, team games and innocent competition were ideal methods of social training in codes of desirable social um, conduct. So if we're looking at the history of, of the development of cricket clubs in Barbados and we're looking at the military, 
we must see that development of the cricket club and the military as being part of what they call that, col that colonialist civilizing mission that the English felt that they were destined to um, transmit to the colonies and to persons who live there. The second, term, second commentary comes from Brian Stoddart, whose voluminous work on sports in general and cricket specifically makes such work as a must read in any discussion on the history of cricket. <coughs> and he says, but of all the games so carefully introduced to the empire by colonial rulers, cricket received primary emphasis. This is no accident. Cricket was considered the main vehicle for transferring the appropriate British moral code from the messengers of empire to the local, I assume he means locality. The colonial governors were especially important in emphasizing cricket as a ritual demonstration of British behavior, standards, and moral codes, both public and private. Sir Augustus Hemming, governor first in, um, in British Guyana and then in Jamaica, and Sir James Hay, who governed Barbados at the turn of the century, has taught the quote there because these are just examples he's given of persons who promoted sport as part of, of the overarching um, empirical or empire, empire building uh, matrix. There can be little doubt then that the pioneering efforts of the military in Barbados in cricket re re represented a resounding success. With, within a few years of the pioneering matches at St. Anne's, the local newspapers are reporting the formation of local civilian clubs. By the 1830s and into the 1840s, the local white elite, sometimes I refer to that white elite as Euro Barbadians, apparently taking the lead from the military, had established two other clubs, perhaps known informally as the City and the St. Michael Clubs. It is very likely that such clubs form part of a cricketing circuit that organized cricket games between themselves and between themselves and the military. Moreover, while we might identify the St. Anne's Club as the pioneering cricket club, we may also identify other cricket, cricketing clubs in the military, although these were probably more organized on a regi regimental basis than, strictly speaking, as clubs. That is, they assumed the identity of whichever unit was sponsoring a match. Thus, on May the 12th, 1838, the Barbadian um, newspaper announced cricket match 70th regiment versus the garrison on Monday next at 6 o'clock. Now, this, this, clearly, the 70th regiment constitutes as St. Anne's, a, a, particular, a particular military formation, but also we might see that as, as a club in, in a loose sense. The next announcement that on the same slide, um, this is on May the 16th, says, the cricket match played on Monday last resulted in favor of the 70, 70th regiment who made 91 runs against 53 of the garrison. And that, these announcements were followed just a few days later on May the 23rd, 1838, by another which read, a surgeon of the 36th Regiment, so another regiment is getting in the act, challenged the best player of the 70th Regiment to play a single game, which was accepted and won by the sergeant. So we have these regiments in Barbados, the 30th, where the, the regiments are foot, some of them call that. They have an artillery unit in Barbados, a sapper unit, the various units, and these units are frequently um, engaged in, um, in cricketing battles um, between themselves and also with civilian groups. These vignettes suggest that the 30th, the 36th, and 70th regiments, and for the other, other units, such as the Royal Artillery, may well vie with the garrison or St. Anne's, as also being among the stimulus for the formation of the civilian clubs that would emerge later in the 19th century. This civilian military nexus is clearly visible by the time that the Wanderers Cricket Club is formed in 1877. Just three years later, on the visit of Prince Albert Victor and Prince George of Wales to Barbados in the warship, the Bakshanti, the governor's aide de camp recorded that the Royal Highnesses had, on New Year's Day, 1880, attended a cricket match between the Bachante and the Wanderers. So the Wanderers is one of the earliest, earlier um, civilian clubs that is formed. But we find that, um, the, again, this question of the military and its involvement, the Bachante visits Barbados. Um, I came across that reference in the Journal of the Barbados, Museum of Historical Society, one of the older journals, which mentions this. But um, I was doing a search, and, I, and just after I acquired this information, 
I came across copies of a, a two-volume journal written by the officers of the Bachante and entitled The Cruise of Her Majesty's Ship Bachante, 1879-1882, compiled from the private journals, letters, and notebooks of Prince Albert Victor and Prince George of Wales with additions by John N. Dalton. Now, when I came across that, I, I seen the aide de camp, I, I seen his, um, his, his report on the princes attending the match, but here now I have now the princes from the other side. He's reporting it from that side, but now the, um, the princes are writing this just two vol vol voluminous um, journals. And they didn't only visit the Caribbean, but they went to all across to the British Empire. And by the time they returned to England and, and they've written the journal, they've gone to China, they've gone to India, they've gone all the place. But they spent some time in Barbados, they spent some time in Jamaica, and I was able to get some information from them. The book was published in 1886 with Macmillan and Co. And it gives a perspective of those who sailed on the ship. Soon after the ship had docked at Barbados, indeed, just two days later, on December the 29th, 1879, this journal reported as follows. There's a cricket match in the afternoon um, between our 11, that's a 11 from the, from, from, um, from the Bashante, and that of the Tourmaline. Tourmaline is another ship, another British warship which is visiting Barbados and the match is organized. And the garrison combined, so the Sedans and the Tourmaline are combining to play the crew from the Bashante, which we won by four wickets. It was played on the Savannah. There are a lot of descriptive elements that are very useful for reading here which is a large extent of rough grass, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so again, this kind of information helps us to, to, to um, paint a picture of the development, early development of cricket and cricketing clubs in Barbados. Next, next um, slide, and I'm going to see a little bit more of that first, yes. After the cricket match, there was a ball at Government House. And it was there that the compilers from the Bachante revealed something of the social order that prevailed in the island. They observed. It seems odd. That we, but we suppose it is natural that in the same way as when out of doors, in our drives, or walks by day, we see no white face, either in the streets or in the country. So tonight there was not one black face at all in all the rooms, and we wondered where all the English came from. Black men and women every day, all night. White men and women only to be seen at night. And then the, the court an artist exol. Ex Congregatis son and Colibius Suis Colica Bunter exhibit Omo ad opus suum at uh, ad operationem suum usque ad vesperum. And I tried to work that out, and it seems to me you're saying that once the sun rises, you know, you, you, have, you, you, you have one, one, one set of behavior, but once it, once it gets cooler and you get to the um, to twilight, where well, there's something else happens. And they're picking up the social realities in Barbados. The very next day, there's a return match, which as the compiler said us, they won again. The main point is that this reinforces the place of cricket in the operational schedule, not only of the local military establishment, but of the visiting forces. Indeed, as the royal princes continue their trip through the, Carib the region later, throughout the British Empire, we see the same round of activities repeated. Thus, after leaving Barbados for Jamaica, the compilers record their observations of their first activities on arrival in the Northern Caribbean destination, Jamaica. On March the 17th, 1880, and she went like this, and it talks about a cricket match in the up park, up park ground in Jamaica. And so just what they're doing in Barbados, there's a repeat of that again. I'm continuing. One of the markers that conforms or confirms the social configuration of the early civilian clubs is that the men are almost always described as gentlemen. While well, the women folk are described as ladies. Moreover, well, it is useful for us to contextualize this early development by noting briefly the hierarchical organization of the Barbarian society, and also noting the way that leisure activities were organized on racial and class bases. We return to the observation of the social order as observed by the princes in their 1879-80 visit. The comment that we have introduced early serves to reflect the social ordering of Barbadian colonial society in the 19th and into the 20th century. Simply put, the hierarchical ordering of the, society, of the social order represented a simple dichotomy. The society is divided amongst strict racial and class lines into gentlemen and ladies and others 
or to put it another way, into workers, laborers, and others. The recreational and sporting calendar also reflected this social ordering. Thus, the visitors of the Barchante had correctly grasped the reality that there were two Barbadoses. In the foreground were members of the white elite, and in the background, as revealing the few photos that have survived from that period, were the masses. Some of these latter may be viewed occasionally as spectators, but seldom as participants at that time. However, over time, that image will change. And there's a little uh, thing I don't know if you can see here. This is a, a photo of which I um, got courtesy of the museum. And it's a, it's, a, um, the, the sto it's a photo of Wonders Cricket Club, that early club of 1877. And if you look at the picture there, if you can, maybe a picture as good as, as I like, but that picture shows you the Wonders Cricket Club sitting down in the front. And if you look at the ordering of the spectators, and look at, if you go down and look through the back, look at the top, in the balcony and see those who are there and then those who are behind it tells its own story of what is happening at the particular time so here you have um this i'm sort of revealing what the people from the bachante had seen at night you have this social gathering but you see all these all these workers by day but when it comes to social gathering you're not going to see them because they're not part of this of that hierarchical order following the establishment of the wonders club the next club to establish was the pickwick club there is some evidence, too, that the Lord's School and Cultural College fielded teams from as early as the 1850s, as suggested in a listing of clubs in Barbados and Jamaica compiled by Hilary Beckles. Harrison College will follow in 1877. But it is not clear whether these institutions, that is, Lord's School, Harrison College, etc., merit being listed as clubs. Except that in these early days of organized cricket, the same social exclusivism that was characteristic of the Wanderers and the, and the Pickwick Clubs also characterized the selection of players in the schools. In the case of Codron College, it is more than likely that its team fielded some non-white players, but it's hardly representing more than a ripple in the racialized social order of cricketing at that time. Three other clubs, the Leewards, the Winbirds and the Belleville Clubs were formed by Euro Barbados in the 1880s and the 1890s. So this, we move from the consideration of the military and its involvement in, in, in the evolution of cricket culture, cricket club, club culture, and now we're moving a little more closely to the development of cricket at the civilian level and certainly of the club level. It must not be assumed, however, that black Barbados were not following the game. And, as in, and indeed, as Reverend Grenville Chester records in 1869, while there were a few games played by the local school children, once exposed, they took kindly to cricket. In his description of the sporting possibilities of rural villages, the greatest obstacle to the spread of cricket in these areas was a lack of suitable space to fashion a cricket ground. And I'll come back to that when we get nearer to the end of my presentation. In that context, we do well to note that there was an ongoing struggle for land space between a hegemonic rural plantation and a rural agro-proletariat. It was rare indeed for plantation landlords to countenance the possibility of a rural workforce with enough leisure time to engage in playing the sport of quote-unquote gentlemen. However, for better or for worse, non-whites could not long be denied their place at a cricket pitch. We have already made mention of the buckle found in England, and depicting an enslaved African playing cricket. And we have already noted that the available data strongly suggests that the background scene and the possible ownership of the buckles points to Barbados. Another very intriguing evidence pointed to the involvement of blacks in the game in Barbados in the late 18th and early 19th centuries appears in an 1809 document which announces a cricket match he played by units of the West India Regiment. And this is particularly important. Um, next, I guess. And the, the advertisement of the match says, a grand cricket match he played between the officers of the Royal West India Regiment for 50 guineas a side on the grand parade at St. Anne's on Tuesday, the 19th of September. The wicket he pitched at gunfire, that is at dawn, the game to commence immediately after, et cetera, et cetera. And it identifies the players um, and how they're addressed um, for this cricket match. Now, this is the West, Royal West India Regiment. Now, what is particularly, yes, that, that it continues <coughs> what happens <coughs> with that game, uh, um, how people address, et cetera. But what is particularly important 
is that the West India regiments were made up of blacks, largely with some white officers. So that in terms of what is happening in this particular um, situation, what I'm suggesting is that you do have some, um, some structured involvement in cricket um, with the black regiments that, that were located here in Barbados. The point he made here is that while the leading officers of the various West Indian regiments were white, the recruits to these regiments were black, and it is unlikely that there were enough white officers to form two teams of 11. In that context, then, it is reasonable to expect that some of the players who made up these opposing teams were black. Indeed, we are aware that for a later period, 1896 to 1897, a white officer, Captain Arthur Maitland Bing, born in 1872 and gazetted into the West Indian Regiment in 1895, cut his cricketing teeth during his service in that regiment. And he's reported to have served in the Boer War. Apparently, as one source puts it, his service in the West Indian Regiment proved rewarding because he played five first-class matches for Jamaica in the 1896 to 1897 season. Thus, it can be little doubt that there are some white or cricketers serving in these predominantly black units who were not disadvantaged in pursuing their sporting careers in the racialist arena of Caribbean society. In any case, we must bear in mind that the racialist social norms and mores that govern the society meant that no matter the social class of a white soldier, in a society where a white complexion guarantees some privileges, however small, questions of access will sharply divide the black and the white soldiers. Even where there might be some physical proximity of the barracks where they were located, this much is uh, captured in the description of the garrison in the late 19th century by, um, by a man called F.P. Garrison, who writes, there are the garrison, <coughs> excuse me, two regiments, the Black Zouave and the English regiment get along very well. But there's no comradeship. It is so the world over. An impassable gulf lies between the two. He writes this in 1902, but he's referring to his observations in the late 19th, in the late 19th century. And he's commenting on the social arrangement of the day. However, we may also note that some Afro-West Indians are also found in the West Indian regiments, and they found a congenial atmosphere for their own social aspirations. Thus, as the West Indian regiments served not only in the Caribbean, but further afield in Africa, some of these Afro-West Indians came to the attention of observers. For example, between 1881 and 1882, according to the Gold Coast Times of Ghana, Five cricket matches were played there on the parade ground of the 1st West India Regiment in Cape Coast. More of this newspaper reported that a number of the players were Afro-Caribbean soldiers, including at least three with the surname Grant and one with the surname Warren. Now, when I heard those, when I, when I read those names coming from the Gold Coast Times, and we recognized that they were um, talking about officers who served in the Royal West India Regiment, and when I worked out that that regiment had also served on, uh, for some time in Barbados, then I came to the conclusion that these were these are the quintessential Barbadian names. Wherever you go, you, uh, you, you can't miss them. I have traveled throughout the Caribbean, and several times you go to a Caribbean country, you hear a name, and you know where to be. That name could only be a Bajan. Some time ago, there was a young man playing cricket for the World Cup, for, I think for Costa Rica, and his name is certainly graphic. Now, there's only one place you get some graphics, Johnny. I mean, there's some Caribbean countries where you find a few graphics. They might be called Brafit in some places and all kinds of things. But once you see those names, you know where they come from. I visited Suriname, and when I visited Suriname, I ran into the director of archives in Suriname. And when I heard his name, his name was Ramon Cumberbatch. And when I heard the name, I knew immediately that he, and when I check, I, I did do the check, the check in. I went back to the archives in Barbados, and I discovered his great grandfather. His great grandfather had migrated to Suriname in the 1880s and served as coachman to the governor of Suriname. So these names tell us something. So this Royal West Indian, this West Indian regiment goes to Ghana, is playing up there, playing cricket, and the Gold Coast Times um, records it. And I am uh, again of the view that we may discover a whole lot more about what's happening in Barbados in cricketing terms if we could get access to the various regimental books of the West Indian Regiment and similar regiments that serve here. So let me move on a little more quickly. Um, whatever the social divide, however, that exists in Barbados, 
Those in the upper echelons of the black community were clear in their minds that they had a claim to the same social norms as the white elite. Thus, in 1883, we witnessed the formation of the Spartan Cricket Club. This aimed to open a space for its members within the social interstices that were occupied and monopolized by whites. It must be understood here that the formation of a club for a few whites and a majority black membership did not mean that its formation marked a full democratization of the cricketing order. By and large, its black membership was confined to a group of blacks and mulattoes who were managed by dint of educational or business attainment to obtain some grudging respect from the white elite. Thus, we know that the first president of Spartan was Commodore Reeves. And of course, we know he was the Chief Justice of Barbados. Um, but there are a lot, of, a lot of questions about whether where he saw his allegiances and his alliances. But the fact remains that he was one of the founders. And this is part of what we say, the attempt by some, some blacks to, to, to get in that same, that, that rarefied air that was occupied by the white elite. Colonel Reese was born in the church, area church, village to Phyllis Clark. And we told she um, might have been an enslaved woman. And, and the father of the white apothecary, Thomas Reese. He was, in, he was very fortunate in getting um, his, some aunts from his father's side to sponsor his education in Barbados. And later, he um, qualified as a lawyer, went off to England, came back, and eventually became Chief Justice of Barbados. In fact, he was, he was more than that. He, there were several other political um, um, offices that he held, but he eventually became Chief Justice. But part of his rise also has to do with the fact that he supported the planters in their reaction to Governor Pope Hennessy when he was trying to reform the yeah, Barbados um, uh, political system and that kind of thing. So when we see that kind of background, we can also begin to imagine that when you find a, a, a Conrees involved in the setting of Spartan, it is not intended to a, a, a democratic institution, bringing all blacks into it, but it really is a, has a very selective membership. Now let me move on again a little further. Uh, Spartan, was, Spartan was organized at a time when competition had been arranged between the various clubs known as the Barbados Cricket. This competition was known as the Barbados Challenge Cricket Cup. While blacks were excluded from membership of the various clubs, that did not preclude black teams from playing against white teams. And Spartan was admitted to the competition. However, the rules of the Challenge Cup were deliberately framed to keep out the lower social orders, who were labeled as professionals. In particular, the various clubs used their groundsmen and other locals in cricket practice. And these men, many of whom had developed strong cricketing skills, were recognized as skill assets in the preparation of a team. Some of these professionals had even organized themselves into a team called Fenwick, which played in the Challenge Cup as an associate member during the 1900 to 1901 season. Notice they're playing as an associate member. This team called Fenwick is not admitted to full membership of the Challenge Cup. They play as associate members, and they can beat, and they beat everybody, but they still they can't win the cup. As an associate member, they cannot be awarded the cup. And um, when and when Clem Cicheran comments on this club, I thought that I should share that quotation with you. But he's not comment. He's he's quoting an informant of the period, and this is what the informant says. And the informant says, "I expect to see the Fenwicks um, beating all the clubs except Pickwick." They have the best bowling in the island, good batting, and splendid feeling. The comment was most likely made before the end of the season, for Fenwick did beat Pickwick later. And, and so, so this comment was a bit premature. Indeed, they also beat Spartan, a team which could not have admitted most of the team members. In any case, it was a Spartan team that would bring to the fore the racism that was represented in Barbados. In 1900, the Barbados Cricketers Annual a publication that had been chronicling details of Barbados cricket since the early 1890s, wrote an expose on the racial configuration of Barbados club cricket. The issue involved Spartan's inclusion of a man called Delmont Hines. And you're going to know him, you're going to come across him later because his name is no, known better as Fitz Hines. But he is, he, is, um, is De, he is born Delmont Cameron Sinclair. And I did do a, a check in the, um, the familysearch.org to see if I can locate him. Um, he's born to, um, to, to um, what we call to humble stock. His parents are listed as John Thomas Hines and Joanna Hines near Harewood. I better check the father's background. The father comes out of 
field labor background. That's where he comes from. So this man, Heinz, is um, eventually um, included in the Spartan team. And by the time that we, he comes to our attention, this is Delmont or Fitz Heinz, he was apparently serving as an apprentice painter, which only places him potentially at the entry level of the artisan class. In any case, his exclusion, his inclusion in the Spartan 11 was surprising for a club that was sensitive to the question of social class. Indeed, it appears that some members of the club, the Spartan, objected to his inclusion. Moreover, Heinz had worked as a groundsman for a Pitway club before leaving that job and seeking admission to Spartan. It was thus the reaction of the Pickwick and other clubs that caught the attention of the editor of the Barbados' Cricketer Annual, J. Winfred Gibbons, who was also a publisher of a newspaper called The Globe. Rule 12 of the rules governing the Barbados Challenge Cup clearly stated into earlier that, quote, no professional staff shall be allowed to play under any circumstances in a cup match. Again, this is an, this is a, this is an exclusionary tactic. But this is what happens. Um, but when Sparta included fit signs into their lineup, it caused all kinds of mayhem in Barbados. And we will now let Jay Winifred Gibbons speak. I, I, I put a large chunk of what he has in it, and I really want you to see it because it is important to get a sense of, of what is happening in Barbados at the time. He says, <coughs> excuse me, we regret it becomes our duty on this occasion to refer to a matter which has invoked great unpleasantness among the local teams and further threatens to strangle the game in our midst. Suffice it to say that it pleased a certain club, and of course the certain club is almost his pattern, to include a certain gentleman, that's fit signs, in its team against whom there was expressed opposition. Both sides held firmly to their conclusions with the result that some games were abandoned and other men refused to play in certain games. That's the first quotation coming from him. We continue. Why he does not identify the clubs involved, we know he's talking about Spartan, and he's talking about the clubs that are objecting, he's talking about Pickwick, and he's talking about Wanderers, and, and maybe Leavers and Rivers. Gibbons continues. We will not contend, contend that these offended gentlemen had no right to express their displeasure at that which they felt was onerous to them. As individual members of a private club, which they maintained by private means, they have the undoubted right to administer its welfare. Next slide. If these individuals were persuaded that to engage the team as then constituted would be derogatory to their princely status and high-born lineage, then they were right to say so but that denouncement should never have been uttered outside the sacred precincts of their own royal club room. And I want you to see the description he has. But he doesn't, he doesn't end there. Let's go to the next quotation, which comes again from Gibbons, and he ends by saying, every known club is possessed of members who will not be admitted to membership in a contemporary institution of the same sort. Men play for local clubs today who are not on a social level with members of other clubs. Indeed, the matter is such a general one that is, it is common to find members of the same club disassociating in a strictly social sense. So that if the action of these gentlemen were to be generally accepted and imitated, we will soon have no cricket played in the island. Gibbons recognizes that no matter what they did, they could not keep black members from raising in the, in the hierarchy of cricket. They couldn't. And he's coming to that. And I drop because this is a contemporary. He's active in the season. He's writing the cricket annual. I've got uh, all, nearly all the copies. I've got them electronically. They're very, very useful in trying to understand what's happening in Barbies at the time. But I'm moving on, up and on, on. It's clear from these last comments that Gibbons had correctly analyzed the changing social scene in Barbados. While the Barbadian landscape still possessed and exhibited the prejudices that had characterized its forward march from the norms of the slave society that had preceded this period, some changes had taken place, and the society that was emerging would later seek to complete the emancipation enterprise. For as for Fitzsimmons, he later played for the West Indian West Indies team which toured England in 1900. Although his performance to the bat was rather modest and his wicket taking as a bowler just adequate, his inclusion in that team was objected to by H. A. Cole, 
a white Barbian who withdrew from the West Indian team in protest against the inclusion of a quote unquote professional. After his return, Hines eventually migrated to the United States of America, where in 1913, he is listed as being part of a team of quote unquote colored players that form a West Indian side to play against Australia and in, in, in the USA. Hines was not the only black to face prejudice. We also have the case of Float Woods and Archie Kumbach, who as Clem C. Sharan tells us, migrated from Barbados to Trinidad to escape the racist selection policies of the Barbados selectors. These two, that is Float Woods and Archie Kumbach, gained selection to West Indian side after playing in the Trinidadian team, opposing to an English side. Now, there are a couple of photographs that are coming up. Now, I'm going to shift my, my position from here for just a moment. I don't have a pointer, but I'm going to shift my position because you wouldn't know who is Fitz Hines in this picture, but I want to show you who he is. That's the side. I assume that you recognize that fit signs is a what you call a fair skin. A fair skin person. <laughs> in short, and not only that, in one or two photographs, they have a notation of that period dubiously identified next to his name. Because it seems as though in some cases he is he is uh, is assumed that he's white. But he is, in fact, uh, that, that person sitting there. I was trying to find a photograph, and I worked and worked and fought hard to eventually. I did from the museum again, had a collection of photographs. I, was able to, I, I wanted to isolate his, but I said, let me bring the whole, um, the whole thing. This is Science and others, um, and uh, that's the West Indies team. This is 1900 at that time. Uh, in that same picture, you'll probably find Floats Woods and Archie Combatch. Next, next slide, please. Next slide. That's Floats Woods. These are persons born in Barbados. He migrates to, um, to Trinidad and eventually plays to the, plays to the West Indies. And the next person is Archie Kambach. Song, sort of Barbadian name. Yeah, don't, not, not a sign fact that he went to play. Now, before moving our narrative forward to another momentous event in the history of club cricket in Barbados and the history of cricket generally, it's useful to step beyond the boundary to see how the developments that we have been chronicling were impacting on the Barbadian society. It is clear that interest in the game had transcended the racial boundaries put in place by the founders of the early clubs. In that context, I cite an encounter between Pelham Warner, an English cricketer with, Barb as I understand it, Barbadian origins, Pelham Warner, um, and, and, and he is um, having an encounter with a black Barbadian on a visit to Barbados. He brings an English team, he comes with an English team, there are a couple of English teams that come in that same period, around 1902, 1901, there, that time. There's a man called Lord Hawks. He brings a team, an English team. This is not England. <coughs> so this is not, um, this is not the English test team. But it's an English cricketer coming to the Caribbean. Lord Hawks, a gentleman called Priestley, brings another group. And of course, Pelham is in one of those groups. Um, just let me see if I get some little of this. Um, I was going to say Bournemouth is Bournemouth too special. But there's nothing but Bournemouth in this, so. Yes, yeah, thank you. Ah, excellent. Okay, yes. On Monday, January the 25th, Padham Warmer's team arrived in Barbados. Just after news of the outcome between the team that had made an early visit had hit the newsstands, and we are informed. Next slide, please. This is in Pelham Warner's book, where he's describing the tour to the West Indies of these English groups. And he, this is what he says. Mr. A. Priestley, having arrived at Barbados a fortnight before us, had played and been defeated in two of his first three matches. Our first news of his doings was received from a, a grinning nigger, now, of course, you understand that's that time. That's what he's saying. Grinning nigger, who screwed his head in through a porthole and with a broadest display of the whitest teeth, showed at the top of his voice. Next slide, please. 
Stoddard, you only, and he has met, but you know, I know from my good vision, but I don't know what the man said, you only met six. Sir. And then he goes on, Pelham goes on to say, the whole population was mad on cricket. And when we appeared on deck, we were surrounded by an excited little crowd who trust papers concern, contain the score of the matches into our hands, declaring the while that Barbados had defeated England. <laughs> now, I, I, I've included this because we're talking about the evolution of cricket and cricketing clubs that certain in Barbados. It's part of the history. And here, uh, here are, here's Petham, he's observing that this, this black man is, is full of joy at what's happening. And I, and I made the point to go on to say here, it's clear that the racial divide in Barbados could not and did not restrain the masses from identifying with the game and from seeing it in it a representation of their own struggle for emancipation. So the, so the idea of beating England is not just a matter of just only cricket an issue, is an issue where people are beginning to identify the beat of England with their own rise in, uh, in progress in, in the game. As a further elaboration of this reality, the next stage in the history of the evolution of club cricket in Barbados belongs to the formation of the Empire Club. This club was formed in 1914, at a time when the turmoil of the First World War and the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia had unleashed social so forces that would change the world forever. We may note that this is also the period in which Barbados, such as Clinton Wickham, Grant Adams, and Charles Duncan O'Neill are acquiring the educational backgrounds that would eventually mark an emerging activism. This is also a period in which W.E. Du Bois in uh, America was flourishing as an intellectual, intellectual bright light in the USA. And 1914 was the year that Marcus Mosiah Garvey, the Honorable Marcus Mosiah Garvey, established the United Negro Improvement Association, UNIA. And it's not inconceivable that this ferment in the Afro-Caribbean and Afro-American world also had a big impact on the persons who would form the Empire Club. Coming soon to the last lap, but let's go into this here. The choice of the name Empire is rather paradoxical. In that it was on Empire's Day, May 24th, 1914, that the die was cast. The celebration of Empire Day represented an acknowledgement that somehow British institutions, heavily encrusted as they were with Darwinist notions of Racial superiority were suitable points of reference for colonial people everywhere, including blacks in Barbados. The paradox is deepened when one considers the serious underlying factors in the formation of the club. Its formation lay deep in the elitist and racist elements that were still shaping elements of bar aspects of Barbadian life. The central figure in this neg narrative is Herman Griffith. And I don't, I'm not going to read all that I have here. I'm just going to summarize what I was saying here about Herman Griffith. Herman Griffith um, was born in Trinidad to Barbadian migrants, comes back to Barbados, goes to school in Barbados, goes to Comair, Comair, and, as you, and, and he's, he, he, he catches the eye of Lena Gittins, a skilled musician, piano tuner, and incidentally my, my late godfather as well. And after he leaves Comomir, and Liz Lenny Griffith, who persuades him to try to get into Spartan. The Spartan. But as several commentators have noted, the social prejudices held by several members of Spartan were still active. And they did not vote him into the, the membership of Spartan. The result was. Several members, including the Gittins, left the Spartan Club, and just two years later, they formed the Empire Club. So the Empire Club was formed as a direct result of what I call the inbred and ingrained social prejudices that still existed in Barbados, and they, and, 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 and they responded to that. Although, as I said, the choice of near Empire and Empire's name also reflects the fact that black Barbadians of that period are still also heavily influenced and acculturated into a, a British system. And in some respects, it might reflect um, an, an, an inability on the part of some of the person at the time to understand the nuances that are come, you know, contained in such a name as the empire. I suspect that the history has so long passed that they will not want to change the name now. But, 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 but that's, that, that's the reality of the time. Stung by this development, the reactionary forces in Spartan did everything they could 
because Herman joins the, um, the, the um, Empire Club. And, the, 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 and at that time, Empire wanted to get into the Challenge Cup. They wanted to play cricket in the Challenge Cup. But Spartan objected. And it took about two years before Empire would be admitted to the Cup, to the District Cup. Next slide, please. Um, that is just a, to show you, in case you don't know, um, Herman Griffith, I had, I had the pleasure of working with his son. His son became um, Chief Technical Director of the, what was then called the Ministry of um, Communications and, and Work. It was a f f Harold. Harold, yes. And he was a football referee in Barbados as well, and was very, very active. So by and large, up to the, even up to the 1930s, there's, still, there's certainly a growing involvement of Afro-Barbadians but direct involvement in club, club cricket is still largely confined to those who the late Donovan calls um, the, bet, up, the better off, the better off people. What this description, description tells us, um, and while it is not to be interpreted in strictly racial terms, issues of race and class in colonial Barbados were so closely tied that the better off did not only refer to Euro Barbadians, but also the blacks who had inherited the same social core values as the white elite. And that is, that is the reality. For what is worth then, club cricket, well into the 1930s and into the 1940s, was still in the grip of entrenched prejudices. So now we come to 1937, and this is where we come to the real, real last, last lap. 1937, the final major thrust to democratize cricket in the island came with the formation of what was then called firstly the Barbados Friendly Cricket Association, which I know you would know well, and which later became known as the Barbados Cricket League, BCL. The formation of the BCL symbolized one of the clearest signs that the descendants of formerly enslaved Barbadians had come of age. Through the various divisions that the BCL established throughout the island, the league did more than perhaps any other grouping at that time to challenge the hegemony of the old plantocratic social order. In that regard, it seems important here to make a few brief comments about the rural context and about some areas of suburban Barbados. Following the abolition of enslavement in 1834, the formerly enslaved and many of their descendants were virtually tied to the plantation through the terms of what was called the Masters and Service Act, which incidentally was not repealed until 1937. There was also the ubiquitous tenancy system, which reflected the planter's hold on land resources. Professor Sir Woodville Marshall's recent article in um, the Journal of the Barbados Museum of Historical Society, and I would really encourage you to, to get a copy, not because I'm the editor of the journal, but because it has in some very good articles in it. And one is by Professor Marshall. He's talking about land speculation in Barbados, and there's, a, there's an important article. The point here is that particularly in the rural areas and some parts of suburban Barbados, there were few social spaces available for a structured cricket player. Thus, any cricket ground to be found tended to be located on rab land, particularly in the, rural, in the rural districts. Indeed, at one time, while I was employed at this West Indian Central Cambridge station, and I had a, little, a, a, a life here at one time as technical assistant to the agronomist, um, and, and as recent as the late 1960s, the prevailing narrative about the nearby cricket ground at Market Hill, St. Augustine, was that when the bowlers approaching up the hill, the first sight of the batsman had of him was when his hands appeared at the top of the hill. He's coming, that, that was, that's what he said. You're coming from down the hill, and as you came up, your hand, the first sight of the batsman saw the a bowler could talk of him. He saw the hand with the, with the ball, you know, he's coming over to bowl. But that, that's typical. That, that's typical of many grounds in the rural districts. Moreover, there's a contentious struggle between the recreational needs of the laboring masses and the labor requirements of the plantation, which meant that gains were more likely than not relatively unstructured affairs in the rural districts, played between houses in the Tenshi village. And I, I have a, a, a hunch, I think a lot of people have seen a hunch, that our critics who were trained in that system, who learned not to hit Miss Brown's house, Sorry, Dr. Brown, but you know what I meant. Not hit Ms. Brown's house, because if you hit, if you hit Ms. Brown's house and break it, you're out. So you learn, to, you learn to control the ball, and you learn that by playing in those locations. And then it goes, I go on to make the point also that 
um, the latest development of the source style marble cricket. And I don't, I, I play my, I, if there's one game I did play in cricket, I was marble cricket. Because we played, we didn't play the hard ball, thank God. And remember my experience, I, so I played marble cricket. In which batsman and bowler played the game from a kneeling position. I am convinced that that was a development that arose out of the situation I just described. A lack of space, you live in these rural districts, <coughs> excuse me, you live in some suburban areas. And in that context, you had to take whatever space you could get. And those spaces tend to be, I said, between the houses in those areas. Michael Redda, in a new Nation News article published on April 25th, 2017, seems to have captured the essence of the matters we are discussing when he says, there's a legend that we play cricket in spaces, big, small, and very small, all over the island. There was a legend that we play cricket on the gully side, in the gully, on the road, on play fields everywhere. There was a legend that we played on pitches that were never perfect. That is a, a quotation from Michael Rada, who was commenting on the development of cricket in Barbados. Given the social context that we are, are presenting here, the formation by the BCL of country, city, and Thursday divisions introduced organized cricket to hitherto underserved areas. And when you hear Thursday division is the representation of what time workers will have. Because some workers got Thursday, some parts of Thursday, and some got part of Saturday. So you had those divisions that, that were reflected um, that, that reality. It's noteworthy that these developments came at a time when the elements of the working class erupted in a confrontation with the colonial state. That's 1937, what people call 1937 rights. Happened in the same year that we get the formation of the BCL. And Grandy Adams is also very closely connected at that time with those who formed the BCL as well. Its founder, Mitch Hewitt, of blessed memory, had a strong sense of timing and destiny. As the BCL expanded its divisions to include the Wimbledon, South and Libra sections in 1938, and then a few years to follow this with the Central, the Cave Shepherd, the Gun Hill, the Carlisle, the Olive Blossom, and the Sewell divisions. It is clear that by the 1950s, Barbados Cup cricket had evolved to the form and shape that we know it today. And I'm saying that the BCL is largely responsible for that final shift, that final move. Spartan had made its, its, um, its contribution empire, but the BCL made the most significant contribution. And we close then at this point with a quote from Sir Hilary Beckles' fascinating book, The Development of West Indies Cricket, Volume 1, The Age of Nationalism, which we will modify very minimally for our purposes. And the quotation is coming on the screen. West Indian cricket culture, and by the way, the insert is my insert. I'm just using him as a vehicle to get across the point as I close. West Indian cricket culture and Barbadian club cricket culture then constituted the main theater with which an intense and transformative democratizing discourse developed with respect to the politics of anti-apartheid. And in the case of Barbados, I think anti-apartheid is, is a term that can well be used to describe the conditions that occupied here right up to the early 1950s or late 1940s at least. It's in that context, therefore, that I invite you to spend some more time in delving into our archives. I've made mention of the, of the, the letter books of diverse regiments. There's so much more history to be, um, to pull out of those, those sources on what has happened in Barbados. And, um, people who are, who are speaking their minds at times. I have a lot of other sources I did not use in this presentation. It was taking us far too long. I've been down here long already, but, um, but there are some other, um, commentators who visited the region. I looked at a lot of travel books. There was one uh, written um, by a fellow called Moxley, Reverend Moxley. He comes to Barbados and he has a, a book on the of West Indian Sanitarium. And in that book, he talks about cricket again and playing the garrison. I went into a book written on the history of, of, um, of, of mental health. And I looked at the early development of, the, of, of the, what was then called the lunatic asylums. And what is remarkable is that the notion of cricket as a, as a civilizing force, the notion of cricket as a, as a tool to, to, um, to, to heal the mind that was somehow disturbed is common. So throughout the Caribbean, wherever you have a lunatic asylum, you have a cricket ground. 
and it's not it's not it's not uncommon that you have matches between those who are in the who are playing in these matches. Sorry, it's not uncommon um, to to, um, to go to a match between the psychiatric hospital and outside forces and have persons who are inmates playing in some of those matches. Um, I am told of one encounter between a team which went down to the psychiatric hospital to play a game and there was a gentleman who was standing by the, um, a gentleman who was part of the team apparently, but the psychiatric hospital team, but he was near the boundary. So then one of the fellows who came from outside um, um, had hit a ball this gentleman ran very quickly and he picked up the ball and he ran back. Oh, ran back with the ball in his hand, ran right back to the pitch. So as he went to the pitch, the fellow who was batting decided he was, going to, he was going to go for home because as far as he's concerned, this man who was coming was a madman. So he ran and the man ran behind him. Well, the man, the man, the man when, he, uh, and he, when he was out of breath, the man, um, the man, the man, the man caught up with him. The man said, Skipper, I want you to do it again, man. Go hit the ball again, man. And, and, and that, that, that's the story. Now, I don't know how true it is, but the fact remains, it, uh, it's a story that comes out of that quick encounter with the lunatic asylum. So without any further ado, I thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. Before I sum up, I will invite you to ask any questions of the Professor Welch. Well, good night, Professor Welch. This was an enthralling lecture as usual. I was just curious, you may have mentioned, you mentioned that Wonders was 1877. I didn't hear the date on which Pickwick was established or the day of Spartan. So I was just curious to know what were those dates, if you have them. Okay, uh, thanks. Wonders was uh, established in 1877. Um, Pickwick is established, I think, in the 1890s. But then it doesn't... It, it, I don't, it ain't, it ain't the one, but it does not acquire, it takes time before it acquires the ground at, um, at Kensington, uh, at which time then it becomes more fully established. But, but that, that's it, that's the one. And you know, Spartan is, is um, late 1893, yes, 1893, yes, yes. Actually, if I may finish that thing on Pickwick, um, Wonders found themselves with nobody to play because of the social things. So they had to help form another club of the same social standing. Yes. And it was Wonders' capt um, captain who helped to form with FSC Claremont, the merchants yes. team, yes. Yes. It is the yes. planters team, yes. as against the, the lower class yes. Yes. whites. But Professor, thanks. So it's been a wonderful lecture. Um, I want to ask you one question. I, I may have <coughs> not it off. Mm -hmm. The Fenwicks, mm -hmm. who were the, what was the social and racial composition of this club? Yes, okay. That's one, yeah. Thank you. Very quickly, Fenwicks was, made up of, was a team largely made up of professionals, meaning Grung's men. Right. Grung's yeah. men, others. Um, I think I actually come back at one time with a member of the Fenwicks, mm -hmm. and um, I had a couple of names which escaped my mind at this point, but they were all of Afro Barbadian extraction mm -hmm. and they were non and they were made up of Grung's men and other persons who worked at Crick, uh, for the various clubs mm -hmm. for uh, Pickwick, for Wanderers and those other clubs. Um, part of the problem with Fenwick is again is the color issue, the race issue mm -hmm. and they were not therefore they were only permitted to enter as associate members of, of the Challenge Cup. That's one of the reasons why because they were considered to be inferior, not, no, not socially acceptable. That fabric, yes. Obviously, they were also professionals. That means they were better than the others. Well, they call them professionals. The, <laughs> word, the, word, the term professional was used as a, the real, it's really a term, a class term. It's re, it, it comes from England. Because in England, in the development of cricket in England, the same issue also arose. And what the English did was they, they coined this category called professional. Mm -hmm. And again, this refers to those persons who were not, were not normally be permitted to um, hobnob 
with their social superiors. Yes, yes, yeah. yes but, but, um, but there were no professionals and teams in the counties in England tended to involve one or two profession, quote unquote professionals in the team. But largely because the professionals, by virtue of working around the cricket pitches, working around the cricket grounds, they became adept at reading the pitch, we understand what's going on. So here in Barbados, a lot, you, you check it, um, there was a man called George Francis, George Kajo Francis. Who was the groundsman at Pickwick? That's right. And eventually he got into, I think, got into the Sydney team at one time. Yeah. And the reason for that, again, here's a groundsman who has been serving on in this season. Very often, these teams would use the groundsmen to bowl at them and to, and to test their bowling, to bat, so that um, it is out of that kind of experience that Fenwick is formed. And um, and what's, and Clem, Clem Cicheran. Um, his work on muscular, uh, what is it, I can't remember the title, the party title, but he, he's one who's written more extensively than I know of anybody else on the question of Fenwick as a team and the persons who, who made it Fenwick. I think at one time, Fitz Hines, Delmont Hines, was a member of Fenwick as well. Thanks. May I make one more comment? Sure. And that is on Sir Pelham Warner. Yes. His father was a, an English civil servant serving in Trinidad. Yes. Sent him to Barbados for his secondary education. Oh, yes. So that's the Barbados so he, comes to, so he comes to Harrison College. Yes. And I think he is a contemporary of, say, HBG Austin. Well, yes. Who, who's another? Who's another? But he's the father of West Indies cricket. Yes, yes. And it so happens that um, Austin is encouraged by Pelham Warner. Yes. Who becomes the godfather of West Indies cricket. Yes. Getting West Indies cricket to be part of the test. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. No, no. There's no doubt. Very, that, very important. There's no Social doubt that, connections. That not enough has also been given to us right. uh, about Pelham Warner, Warner and some of those who played yeah. such a pivotal role. Because they are in Crumpton Street. Hello? Played his cricket in Crumpton Street. Yeah, well, you see, that, 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 that's a crucible um, at that time. But certainly, certainly, um, when you read Pelham Warner's book, um, that will quote I gave you with this Belgian fellow who, mm -hmm. who is exulting at the fact that Barbados be England. Um, that he is an observer. Yeah. So he goes to the Caribbean, he goes to Dominica, he goes to St. Vincent, he goes to Trinidad, he goes all over the Caribbean to British Guyana, and he records what is happening not only on the field but outside the field. And I think that his work becomes um, a very important work in understanding um, the history of cricket in this region. Thank you very much. Thank you very much too. Yes. Any other? Any other? Yes, sir? Yes. Um, very good lecture, Professor. Very interesting. Uh, two questions. Sure. I show that as you research, you will develop this some more. <coughs> I am interested in, or I suspected for a very long time, mm -hmm. that Barbadians and West Indians master the game of cricket as a kind of national psyche against the former colonial masters yes. and such. Are, are you seeing any connection? Are you concerned that we don't seem to be able now to use that as a tool of our na regional nationalism? The way our team has declined and there don't seem to be any way out. I, I want to hear your thoughts on that. Yes. And secondly, I was listening more, I know it's a short lecture, but I have, in my own research, I've been looking at the development of the BCL. Yes. And, and the way how cricket spread into yes. almost every community and village. Yes. And how the skills were developed there. Your thoughts on that, on the BCL, and the role that it played in developing um, Barbados and West Indian cricket. Thank you very much. Um, I'm trying to remember the, the, um, the, the first question. It's, it's, it's something that oh, yes. you know, as a researcher you would think about. Question of nationalism. Um, the kind of nationalism and yes, yes. confidence that it yes. cricket gave to our people. Yes. And when we defeated England, we felt that this is the height of national price. Now, if that is a prop for what we have people that have done, yes. what the decline of cricket is saying yes. about us, and could it have an effect on us in the future? Yes. Quite, 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 quite a very important question. And the question of, of nationalism, I, I, I'm referring back to the quote I gave from Warner when he comes to Barbados, and the first thing he's greeted with, this gentleman who, who pronounces on the victory over, in quote-unquote, England, 
And not only does he um, speak about that, but he talks about the crowds and how the crowds are responding. They're, great, they're bringing these papers, they're excited about what's going on. And I have interpreted that to represent an early expression of what they call the anti-colonial struggle um, that our people would be involved in over the years. Um, when, we look at, when we look at the formation of Spartan, and then later the formation of empire clubs, is also a continuation of that struggle, a struggle which we can trace right back to the um, emancipation period and just the post, immediate post-emancipation period. There's a continuing element in that struggle. Um, in some cases, the element, what, what confuses persons that that they don't quite understand how it is that blacks can both aspire to what we may call to some of the cultural traditions, as to the, 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 to the cultural, um, cultural norms of, of, the, of the whites, while at the same time struggling to uh, an identity for themselves. But the fact remains that if you want to succeed in the society, you look for those elements of success that you'll see, uh, however you measure them. And for example, um, we have the same um, issue um, when, it, when you go back to the period of enslavement. I've often asked people this question. Why is it that many blacks, when they get their freedom, one of the first things they do is they invest in getting slaves? And this is true of nearly all the free blacks and free colors that I've identified in that pre-emancipation period. And I have come, and I've told them there's a simple answer. What is the clearest, what's the clearest um, evidence of your own freedom in a slave society. In a slave society, the clearest evidence of your own freedom is your capacity to own somebody else. It's a perverse kind of thing, but very often you have to understand where it is that many of the free blacks and free colors do end up by owning slaves themselves. Uh, and it really has to do with the fact that I've looked around. I'm, I'm, I speak as, as, as if I'm in that situation. I looked around, and, the, and, the, and the, the models of success that I see are these models. So that when it comes down to time for me to define my own success, I'm going to define it in those terms. But having said all of that, that does not, does not mean that um, over time that blacks will not um, develop a, a greater sense of identity and also a greater sense of the possibilities. Of, um, of confronting the colonialist forces. So that when we look into the 1930s, 1940s, as you have done, when you look at the formation of UNIA and Barbados, the various UNIA branches, when you look at um, not only the formation of the UNIA branches, but you look at, at, the, at, at the formation of French society in Barbados and all the other institutions that are developed in the period by black persons, a lot of that is speaking to a, a sense of of themselves as persons. That's the, that's the first step, first, as persons. But then secondly, as persons who have every right to confront the colonial structure. In some cases, that confronting the colonial structure means beating them at their own game. So when the West Indies, when, when, Herman, when Herman Griffith, when Larry Constantine and others go off to England and do so well, and the masses interpret that as their victory. It's a victory against the colonial masters. That's, that's the first one. The second issue, which has to do with um, the BCL and its organization and what it does when it goes around the country, there's absolutely no doubt in my mind that that BCL mission is a democratizing mission. It spreads cricket to every nook and cranny in Barbados, everywhere. And it is responsible, if you look at the list of persons who come out of the BCL, um, I think Everton Weeks um, began with VCL. I think it later goes on a place for other, other groups. Um, I think Conrad Hunt, I think, comes out of that as well, too. And there are a whole lot of cricketers that you find going on to do, uh, do their senior duty and who would not have had that opportunity were it not for the BCL. But quite apart from playing cricket, we have to look at the BCL as, a, as, a, as, a, as representing a new, a new organizational matrix. Because by organizing your divisions, and you give people in those divisions, they, they, they form teams. And when teams are formed, teams get leaders. You get captains. You have personal certain responsibility. And what you're doing, in fact, by, by, by extending cricket to the masses, you're developing organizational skill. And that organizational skill is, is at the level of the club, the level of the team, and, and, set, and also the core question of sense of 
sense of achievement. That, that is particularly important. And um, when you look at the various um, divisions all across the place, and also the alliances that are formed, um, you notice I said there's a cave shepherd division. And I saw about that for a little while and, and thought that that was something that needs further investigation. But the person, Mr. Cave, from Cave Shepherd, um, the, he was a supporter of the BCL. And um, I used to give sponsorship money, or sponsorship to some of the uh, prizes, et cetera. So that there's something to be said about what Mr. Yurt and his companion think. Don Norville was a part of that group as well, too. Um, I, you, were, you were also connected with, with, with the, um, very much so, with the Barbados Cricket League. Still? No, still. All right. Yes, but, but, but you have that. But the, the important thing I said is that the, the, what this club does, what, what, what this organization does, because not, I say it more, more than a club because it forms divisions. And in those divisions, you have clubs out there who play. And I, my argument there simply is that, um, that that represents for the masses that, that development of, uh, as I said, of, of, of skills, critical skills, which can be transferred to other, other things. Politics transferred to other areas of life. A lot of the cricketers, Claremont, the piece I think is, um, is one who was in that as well. And when you look at where these cricketers go and what they do after, um, a lot of them um, migrate in some cases, some of them go and play in the English counties. But it is a fascinating um, insight into how Barbadians are thinking and what they're doing, period. It's, it's a, a badge, a mark of what I call an, 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 as people who aspired and have now reached a point where the aspiration has become a reality. So it's very important. Thank you for the question. Very important. Okay. At this point, and on the assumption that there are no more questions, I will just do a few fillers, and uh, I would perhaps do what I did not do at the beginning and acknowledge the most important um, persons who made this enlightening lecture very possible. That is the Barbados Museum and, and uh, Historical Society. And of course, um, the, I will speak of Professor Welch a little later. But at this point, I said fillers because um, I played in the BCL even before I played for my school, the law school. And I can tell you, playing BCL cricket is, has been more difficult for me. And it's been more difficult because the, most of the playing fields, especially in the country, as the professor mentioned, were carved out between the sour grass, which you couldn't cut because these are the days of the mules, the cows, and all the animals on the plantation that ate grass, that grass had to be retained. And the plantation owners carved out a trap in the grass field and permitted the laborers to, to use the, 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 um, the trap. And they even watched cricket because there's one person who stands out in my memory, a privileged plantation manager called Mr. Charles Armstrong, whose son Joey became a um, distinguished solicitor in, in, in Bridgetown, and indeed two of his sons became um, distinguished farmers in, the, in other parts of the country. But Mr. Armstrong was a founding member of the Windward Cricket Club. Windward Cricket Club left Poole and it was handed to a BCL team called the Danes. And at Clifton Hall, which was contiguous to, uh, to, to Poole, the he Mr. Haynes at Clifton Hall gave patronage to a club called the Romans. And that created so much interest, a match between the Romans and the Danes would be a failure if it did not attract 500 people on pool pasture. Pool pasture is um, no longer available, but if you came from Four Cross Roads and you see the wood there, 
that is where the, the Wingwood Cricket Club um, played before it handed over to the Danes, which in turn handed it over to the BCL club called Hadley, of which I and other contemporaries at the law school were co-founders. So a lot of this stuff um, almost brought nostalgic tears to me. And now that I'm at it, let me say that I was at the receiving end of a, a gatekeeper called Bulldog in the park. And when he came down as a schoolboy to score for the law school, he told me I couldn't go into the pavilion. I said, but I am scoring. I showed him his scorebook. He said, you had better wait until Mr. Walker came. I'm not going to mention either, mention any names, but I know the one to which he was referring. The whole thing about Empire and Spartan, which was also mentioned by Mr. by Professor, uh, is what the rejection of Herman Griffith, who, in the popular language of the time, was blackballed because membership, I'm told, you used to have black balls in a jar and a white balls in a jar, and you, when voting time came, you just went and put them, put the, the ball, the, the pair there. So, so Herman Griffith was black, black balled from entry into the, the uh, thing. And although he had secondary education, and uh, he was employed in, as a public health officer, he could not get into the Spartan Club. And as was previously stated, the Gittins brothers, who were very prominent in that club, and whose son Stanton became headmaster of Harrison College. Their father, Cormier, Cormier, became, yes, he, he was a master at Harrison College in my time. He was teaching at Harrison College in my time. Cormier, he, um, Enable help help um, Herman to put the um, the Empire Club on the map, so that um, the story about Saint Augustine Saint Augustine Cricket Club up by the church Saint Augustine Church mm -hmm. was actually that cricket ground was actually in a gully, and it is a fact because I played there that when the bowler went and came out of the steeple. He, he took his run and walked through the staple. My captain unkindly put me to, to, to feel what would be regarded backward square. Morris Grinch, who has a little acquaintance with cricket, would probably tell you. There's no way I could see the bowler when he was coming up. <laughs> and the man at square leg would say, he's coming. I actually took a catch. <coughs> And I didn't see, the, I saw this, the, the ball coming through as if a bird was coming to attack me. And I stuck my hand up. The ball stuck in my hand. And the fella square leg, the he's back square leg, was so excited that he ran, ran, ran down. And before I could keep the ball in the air, he knocked me down in the grass in the gully. And, and it nearly broke my neck. But these were sort of the, the stringent conditions under which the cricket league played. But I used to cynically say that the plantation managers accommodated the, the laboring class, helped them with, with, with these traps to play cricket, because at least it was a day off for the, uh, a sort of day off for the plantation watchmen who would walk through the crowd to check to see where some um, well-known um, thieves were watching cricket or where they were stealing arms and potatoes. So it was the interest of the plantation managers and no crossing over into country history. I, don't, I know you don't teach this course at university, <laughs> right? <laughs> and um, once he identified the, 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 um, the particular person, he would relax and watch cricket too. But apart from that, he didn't have a day off because he had to go through all the plantation cart tracks to make sure that the um, fields and the potato fields were not being um, attacked. So 
lots of stuff came crowding back to me, but I'm not here to lecture. I'm just here to, to sum up and to thank the professor for um, what for me was a very stimulating and nostalgic um, experience. Incidentally, Seven of the week started to play BCL cricket at a club called Westshire, somewhere in Carrington's village. He joined the, uh, the gar and then he played, he went to the garrison, he became a soldier and became a corporal in the, in the, um, garrison, at the, at the garrison. And he played for Garrison Sports Club. I think his first first division game was as a member of the Garrison Sports Club. He went on to play for Empire, as we all know. The rest is, the rest is history. But that is, that is how it started. That a lot of these, uh, these um, very talented players, they not have any option other than to play BCL cricket. Because A, they probably didn't have the, the fees to, to pay. And, and B, there was intense snobbery. And it, was, it had its classification because I, as a country boy, working in town, having, after leaving school, was told that Spartan didn't want any country boys. That was my personal experience. Each other and I became uh, close after, and I never allowed him to, to forget what he told me. And uh, incidentally, he used to work in the labor department. That's where I met your dad, right? <laughs> so um, let me now sum up by saying thanks to the, the society and uh, particular thanks to Professor Welch for, um, for delivering. And thank you, uh, the audience, for coming. <coughs> the only re thing I regret is that such high, st an interested, high standard and interesting lecture um, was not shared by more people. But I believe that if the matter is recorded and taped, that some effort should be made to see if we could get CBC to, to reproduce it, because things of this quality should not, should not be a, a one-off thing, and we not, should not and we should, should benefit from it. And repetition of a, a, a lecture of this standard um, would be a very good thing. Once again, thank you very much for coming. I don't believe that um, if I detain you any longer, that my, my limited attempt to, to do the fillers would have been lost, and you probably get annoyed with me. I am ready to go home, and you are detaining me. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming. Get home safe.